I'm going to give you a, uh, an overview of uh, what it is that, that we do as, as, a, as a group um, uh, and what we do collectively as scientists to try and understand uh, what we're dealing with, uh, with with climate and the climate system and climate change. Um, the world is extremely complex and dynamic. Uh, the patterns that you can see here in these clouds, um, which is not real by the way, this is a computer simulation. This is not. This is uh, this is in a this is in a on a laptop, not on a not on a satellite. Um, but the patterns that you can see are very similar to the ones that you see in the satellite. Uh, you can see storms, you can see uh, convection, you can see waves going through, you can see things repeating but not quite, right? That's the essence of the system that we're talking about. It's a, it's a complicated, chaotic, dynamic system. It never quite repeats. And yet, all of the processes that are going on that underlie all of the things that are going on with these clouds, they're understandable. They're uh, computable. We can go and measure all of those different individual things. How do we deal with that? The challenge is, is one of scale. The scales of the climate system range from micrometers for small aerosol particles that uh, form the nuclei of clouds in the atmosphere, all the way out to the size of the planet itself which is about 10 to the 8 meters. That's about 14 orders of magnitude. That's an enormous scale range in which to encapsulate uh, all the things that are going on. And even in time, you know, you're going from things that are happening on microsecond scales to things that are happening over millennia. Again, 14 orders of magnitude, an enormous range of scales to comprehend and put everything together. That's an enormous challenge. What you have when you build a model, then, is, is, is you have some fundamental constraints. We don't have infinite computer power, right? So how does that work? Well, with weather models, right, the ones that produce the forecasts that you see every day, the kind, of, the kind of resolved physics, the things that we can expressly include in these models, go from the global scale down to about the 50-kilometer scale. Right? That's only a very small part of that huge range of scales that, that actually impact the climate and the weather. Right? The stuff that we can resolve, the stuff that we can say, OK, we totally understand that, we can put in the exact equations, is just that small part. All the rest of it is what we call these subscale processes. Now, that stuff is, is how a cloud actually forms, how rainfall actually comes from a cloud system, how evaporation works uh, at, at a very, very small scale. And all of those things need to be approximated in some way. We need to uh, have some empirical, phenomenological approximation to that physics uh, to allow the rest of it to work. And that's a real challenge, right? There's, this, is, this is turbulence. This is uh, small-scale heterogeneity. This is small mountains and small hills and small lakes. All of those things have to be squeezed into our approximations of those subscale processes. So there's no guarantee that this works, right? There's no guarantee that this is even a program that will lead to successful predictions. And so the test of this program is whether it does actually produce successful predictions. Now, you might not like the weather forecasts that you get. You might think that they're terrible. But actually, they're much, much better than they used to be. Weather models are skillful at producing forecasts three, four, five, six days, almost 10 days out uh, in ways that were unforeseeable uh, even 20 years ago. Now, climate models are a slightly different beast. Climate models have to use longer time scales because climate is on a longer time scale. And so the compromise they make is they don't go to quite such fine detail. And so back in the 1990s, climate models really only occupied that very small part of that, of that space. Now we can go a little bit further. So in the 2010s, so the models that we're working with now, you know, we're coming out to about the same uh, 
spatial uh, resolution as the weather models, and we're taking up more times. You know, we're going out for a thousand years uh, and working on the physics at the same kind of time scale. And yet, we still have this large, large range of subgrid scale processes that we still have to include. This is a climate model. Uh, this is an old climate model, you'll be pleased to know. We don't use punch cards anymore. Um, it's a single line of Fortran. We still do use Fortran for any of the old timers here who think that, that their skills are no longer uh, valid. They are still valid, yes. You can have a job with them. Um, each of these colored bands was a single subroutine, a single calculation of some physical aspect of the code. Um, and you would put them into a machine one at a time. And if you got them in the wrong order, you'd have to start all over again. Uh, it would take months to produce uh, uh, any output. Um, and it was a very, very clunky uh, thing. And so obviously, if you have to write out every line using punch cards, you don't include a lot of comments. So you know, we inherited this code and we're going, what does this code do? We have no idea. Anyway, so it doesn't quite look like that anymore. Um, but the, uh, the essence, the, the, the idea of what we're doing is directly related to what we did back in the 1980s and in, uh, in the, well, this is before that, 1970s. OK, so how do we actually go around building a model? We do it one piece at a time. And I used a, a jigsaw analogy right at the beginning. And I'll kind of work with that a little bit now. Uh, it's very much like putting together pieces of a jigsaw. So this is a piece of the jigsaw. It's a picture of Arctic sea ice taken from a, a flight going across the North Pole. Uh, each of those ice flows that you can vaguely see there are a few tens of kilometers across. And you can see leads in the middle. Uh, it was uh, the summertime, so the ice was breaking up. Um, and so there's a lot of physics that's going on there, right? So there's the physics of the sun coming in, reflecting off the ice because it's white. There's the physics of the, uh, of the, the heat being absorbed in the ice, uh, melting it from the top, and there's melting from the bottom going on at the same time. There's dynamics, how each of the ice flows interacts with each other. All of those things can be encapsulated, measured, and, uh, and put into some kind of uh, formula. So here are some of the formulas. Yeah, so physics, you know, I don't expect you to, uh, to, to look at these or critique these. Um, but this is basically what we do. We write down what the boundary conditions are. We use calculus. We use um, basic uh, conservation of energy. That's, uh, that's a big deal. And for each of those different things, we then take uh, some code. And you get lots and lots of lines of code. There are some comments now. That, that's pleasing. Um, this is a, the, the last bit that does some melting. And we make that one piece into like a component. And so, you know, okay, well, when we do sea ice, that's the piece of code that we're going to use. And we can add in lots of different processes. So that was the sea ice process. Now there's one, uh, there's a process that's associated with clouds. There's a process that's associated with radiation and the solar radiation coming through the atmosphere and being absorbed at the different layers of the atmosphere. That's one more piece. There are other pieces. The winds and the waves and other pieces. The flow of water through plants. The flow of water in rivers back down to the ocean. So the point is that each of those bits makes up part of the picture of the climate system. Now, I've left some pieces out because our picture of the climate system is not complete. Right? We don't know everything about the system. And yet, when we put it all together, we end up with uh, a simulation that has all of the emergent properties that we can see in the real world. Right? So these storm systems in the Southern Ocean you can, anybody who's been to the Southern Ocean knows exactly what they look like. Or storms in the North Atlantic, Kevin can tell you about those. Uh, tropical cyclones in, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, the convective bands uh, in, in the, uh, well, there's a couple of tropical cyclones that are going to cycle around each other. It's kind of neat. Yay. Now, within the code, there was no code that says, hey, do an atmospheric river that hits Oregon. There's no code that says do tropical cyclones and make them dance around each other. 
right? All of these things are emergent properties that just arise from the fact that the system that you're modeling is chaotic, is dynamic, and all of the different processes that we put together intersect and interact in ways that you can't predict a priori. Now, just having done that, I think, is a intellectual endeavor worthy of, uh, of, of Plato and, and, and Chomsky, right? Trying to understand exactly what's going on in such a complex system and being successful at doing so is an enormous challenge and I think one that we can rightly be proud of. But we're not just doing it to understand the system. We're doing it because that system can be kicked in many, many different ways. And right now, humans are kicking this system in a very particular way. So let's look at some ways in which the system can be kicked. Right? So there are wobbles in the Earth's orbit. These wobbles kind of uh, make a difference on 10,000 to 100,000 year timescales uh, and are a big driver of the, of, the, uh, of the Ice Age cycle that we've been seeing uh, for the past 2.5 million years. Right? So, uh, Iceland used to have a lot more ice. It's not quite as icy as it used to be. And, and, and it will, well, it will get less icier as well. But um, uh, 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, Iceland was almost completely glaciated, right? Is that right? Yeah. Um, and that's due to these wobbles. So that's, that's a very powerful kick to the system, right? That's everything changed. You know, can we understand that? Okay, um, there are changes because of the sun. The sun has cycles, it has activity, and it's over its lifetime, over the lifetime of the Earth, um, has uh, expanded and become more active by about 30% over the last four billion years. That has an impact on the climate. The, so the solar cycles on an 11-year cycle have an impact on the climate. We need to understand those things. Volcanoes, as you're also well aware, have an impact on the climate not just locally, but they can have a global impact on the climate uh, by the uh, injection of uh, sulfates into the stratosphere, changing the albedo of the planet, changing the amount of energy coming into the system. Right, so you're getting the idea. There are lots of different ways in which we can change the climate, right? Or that the system itself can be changed. Whether it's biomass burning, ozone depletion, land use change, contrails, or, of course, greenhouse gases. All of these change the balances and the flows of energy in the system, and when you change the balances and flows of energy in the system, you change the climate. So, what we need to understand is whether the simulations that I discussed before, whether the weather models or the climate models, whether they have skill. And I want to be very clear about this. These models are not complete, right? There were holes in the jigsaw. There's whole bunches of things that we have to em empirically fill in, right? That we, that we can't predict from a priori uh, considerations. So why do we think that these things are useful? We think that they're useful because they have demonstrated skill. Now, skill is... Uh, a model result is skillful if it's better than what you would have had otherwise. That's not to say it's perfect. It's not to say that there aren't uncertainties. But it's something that's better than what you had before. With a weather forecast, you could stick your finger in the air and predict what the weather was going to be tomorrow based on just persistence of uh, the weather today. That probably doesn't work very well here, but it works quite well in New York. But we can do better than that with models, right? Weather models are skillful, despite the fact that there was that whole range of things that we had to empirically include. And so we need to demonstrate that climate models are skillful at estimating the changes to the climate when you kick that system in all of the different myriad ways that that system can be kicked. OK, so is that true? Is the, are the models skillful? So, well, they, you know, volcanoes are a, uh, a current topic of interest in, uh, uh, in Iceland. Except, uh, well, actually, not, not anymore, right? We're done with the volcanoes, <laughs> right? So that's it for, for the next week, right? <laughs> no more volcanoes. Okay. 
Are models skillful with respect to big volcanic forces? So the large big volcano that we had that had a global impact uh, was Mount Pinatubo, which went off in June 1991. Um, uh, and this is a, a graph of uh, how much stuff, basically, there was in the stratosphere uh, from uh, the main eruption, and then it took like three or four years for all of that stuff to kind of fall out of the atmosphere. Okay? So this is actually quite a large amount of stuff. Right? Um, the amount of stuff that, that is there, that's the technical term, stuff, I'm glad some people are paying attention. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, the amount of stuff that was there caused the radiation to be, from the sun to be significantly less than it was, right? Because each of those little particles is white, um, and so when the sun shines on a white particle, it reflects out to space, and that reduces the total amount of energy coming in. The amount of energy going out was pretty much the same, and so you have less energy coming into the system. Right, so basic conservation of energy suggests that that would lead to a cooling of the planet. But by how much? How much should the climate cool with a 3 watt per meter squared energy imbalance over a few years? You have to do the calculation, and the climate models allow you to do that calculation. So what do they suggest? Well, what they suggested are the, the little thin lines that you can see there. There's a bit of noise because of the different weather in each of those models. And then the, the red line there is what actually happened. So the models were able to estimate quite precisely the rate at which the, the climate cooled because of this forcing. And we know that is better than what we could have just worked out by doing a calculation on the back of the envelope. And in fact, the first time that we did that calculation, we did it in October 1991 and made this prediction before any of those changes had actually occurred. The model was skillful. And it wasn't just skillful at estimating the global cooling, which, you know, kind of by energy balance arguments, you might argue was the easy part. But it was also skillful at predicting that in the winter time, you got a strange pattern in Europe where you'd actually get winter warming after a big volcano. And that turns out to be a dynamic response. Changes in the winds that are affected by the temperature changes aloft that actually push more warm water over, uh, more warm air over, uh, over Europe during the winter time. And that is also captured by the model. And the models are skillful even with the dynamics and the radiation and the temperature. There are lots of other examples. Solar cycles, you know, we can measure and calculate the change in ozone in the stratosphere because of the change in the sun. With models are skillful because of that. Uh, in orbital changes, those wobbles in the Earth's orbit, like even 6,000 years ago, they were relatively important, and we can look at that difference, and the models are skillful at estimating how the northern hemisphere temperatures got better, uh, or uh, changed because of that. Okay. The response to the ice sheets 20,000 years ago, the models are successful at getting that right. The 20th century multi-decadal trends were successful at getting that right. Models are skillful at even bizarre things that have happened to the climate. About 8,000 years ago, there was a huge great lake that covered most of Manitoba and Ontario, much larger than all of the great lakes that exist right now. And it was kept in place by the remnant um, by the remnant uh, uh, ice sheet that was kind of sitting over Hudson Bay. About 8,000 years ago, that ice sheet finally broke, and all of that water that was kept in that lake rushed into Hudson Bay and into the Labrador Sea and into the North Atlantic around here. And at that same time, there is evidence of a cooling event that happened in the Greenland ice cores, in Europe, and in Newfoundland, and all around here. And I'm sure that there would, uh, Iceland would have been affected as well. The models are skillful at responding to that water going in by changing the circulation in the, uh, in the ocean and by changing the temperatures and the rainfall patterns associated with that. The models are skillful across a whole range of different ways that we can kick that system. Okay. And that system is complicated and global. Right? This is a simulation, again, of tiny little atmospheric particles and all the different kinds of particles that you can have. These orange 
uh, swirls, a dust coming from the Saharan desert. And you can see them affecting the climate and affecting uh, deposition of, uh, of stuff all the way across the Atlantic. The white wispy parts over, over Europe, you can see that's atmospheric pollution and sulfates. Right? And you can see that what happens in Europe does not stay in Europe. The green and the reds indicate where there, is, uh, where there are fires and where there is biomass burning and where there is organic carbon and black carbon being put into the atmosphere. And again, these things don't just stay where they, were st where they started. You can see the pollution over China, uh, that again, does not just stay in China. The blue dots associated with the big tropical storms are associated with sea salt particles. So as the winds whip up the waves, small particles of sea salt, which are a key element in uh, the production of low-level clouds, you can see them again in the, uh, in the Southern Ocean. All of these things are connected and important. And we can answer now with the, with the, uh, with the computer models that we have, we can answer questions that, associate, that are associated with all of those things. How does pollution change climate and air quality all at the same time? I love this, uh, this, uh, this animation. They, they did a really nice job here. This is my colleagues at NASA uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. And oh, there's another volcano in Madagascar that just went off. Right? So you can include all sorts of things in these models and answer all sorts of actually quite subtle and interesting and nuanced questions. Okay. How do things work over the 20th century when we've seen an amount of global warming? Right? So this is, this is a model simulation. This is the observations. You can see the patterns of weather you know, and they're not correlated. The weather isn't predictable 50 years in advance. But the emerging patterns of change that you see towards the end of the 20th century and that we end up where we are today, those patterns are predictable. They are predicted by the models. The models are skillful at getting these patterns right, this warming in the Arctic compared to the Antarctic, the warming over land compared to the ocean, the warming in the north versus the warming in the south. These are skillful models. But then let's think about the real reason why we need models. Right? And, and this, this comes from a, uh, a rebuttal that, uh, that two scientists wrote when somebody, you know, they, they talked about modeling of, uh, of, uh, of uh, future tropical cyclones, and somebody wrote a response to them. And they said, well, why aren't you looking at observations? And they responded, I think, quite funnily. Well, if we had observations of the future, we obviously would trust them more than models. But unfortunately, Observations of the future are not available at this time. And that's funny, but it's actually the real reason why we build models. We want to have predictive capability of situations where we don't yet have any observations so that we can make plans accordingly. Whether it's a weather forecast, whether it's a climate forecast, whether it's an economic projection, which we could get into as, uh, as well. But, uh, um, what we want are, uh, is an ability to make informed decisions about the future. Right? So predictability and predicting the future is the absolute fundamental uh, reason why we're looking at models. Right? That's what science is all about, making predictions, testing your theories, adapting them, making them better, making them more predictive. So what does the future hold? What we have in the future, of course, are choices. Right, we don't have to fall down one particular line. The economy, the economy, technology, how we structure societies, these things are not written in stone. We have choices. Society has choices. You, individuals, have choices. And these aren't you know, completely accurate labels. Um, we don't know really what will happen if we just continue as we go along. This is an estimate of that. Um, we have a pretty good idea of what it would take to bring everything kind of back down to the level that it was, uh, you know, at the beginning of this century. Um, this aggressive mitigation, like um, Kevin will tell you, this is not going to happen. This is the under two degree world that people uh, talk about sometimes. Business as usual. 
That's a five, six degree world. That's a totally different planet. Remember how different the Ice Age was to today? Well, that is just as different, but in the opposite direction. The Ice Age was a different planet, different organization of ecosystems, where people lived, where things lived, where things grew. The same will be true for uh, the business as usual planet. Where we're more likely to end up, in my opinion, is some uh, effort at serious mitigation, not today, not tomorrow, maybe in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, and that will still be a planet that has significantly uh, warmer temperatures, particularly on land, particularly in the north, particularly in the Arctic. This will be a radically different planet as well. But exactly how different is still to be determined. But the choices are really ours to make. Now, I, I'm a scientist, and, and I spend my time working on those small-scale processes and the encapsulation of all of that physics that you saw in those animations. And these projections, these predictions, put us in a very odd position. And it was very clearly encapsulated by Sherwood Rowland, who uh, was the, one of the, the chemists who discovered the reactions that led to ozone depletion. And some of you here will remember spray cans and Freon and the Montreal Protocol and how that was uh, negotiated and how that changed. So Sherwood Rowland understood um, quite clearly the consequences of having made scientific discoveries that have real-world implications. And he said in an interview, what's the use of having developed a science well enough to make predictions if, in the end, all we're willing to do is stand around and wait for them to come true? And that's really the dilemma that people like me face. Do we just continue to make predictions or do we go out and tell people about what these predictions mean? Do we go and help people work out what they should do about their energy system? I'm not an expert in energy systems. You know, should we use nuclear power? Should we use geothermal power? Should we do this? Should we do that? Those are decisions that are not up to me, though I would like to think that the information that we produce informs the decisions that you make individually and that you make as a city or as a country and as the world. And I don't know what our future will hold, um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that whatever future we choose, it's an informed future. So thank you very much.